today I am like super excited to have Raymond Moody and Lisa Smart on the program. I'm going to read their short bios, but their media kits will be listed listed in the show notes because they there's a lot to be said about both of them and all of their unbelievable work. Raymond, Dr. Raymond Moody, PhD, MD, is a world-renowned scholar, lecturer, and researcher, and is widely recognized as the leading authority on near-death experiences, as he coined the term NDE. He's the best-selling author of many books, including Life After Life, Glimpses of Eternity, The Light Beyond, and Coming Back. Dr. Moody's work profoundly illuminates our understanding of death, dying, and grief, and offers compelling answers to the question, is there an afterlife? Lisa Smart, MA, is a linguist, book coach, and writer. She is the author of Words at the Threshold, What We Say When We're Nearing Death. The book is based on data collected through the Final Words Project, an ongoing study devoted to gathering and interpreting the mysterious language at the end of life. She has worked closely with Raymond Moody, guided by his research into language, particularly unintelligible speech. They have co-facilitated presentations about language and consciousness at universities, hospices, and conferences. Lisa has also written Cante Bardo, Veil, Diet for a Broken Heart, and Lessons in Lullabies. Welcome to the program, both of you. Hello, hello. Yeah, yeah thank you for having us. You're welcome. It, it's so yeah. exciting to have you. And we were just talking a few minutes before about how I met Raymond and Lisa. Somehow I ended up on an airplane flying to Athens and um, and met them. And I don't know, some sort of magic just sort, sort of happened. And I was just thanking them so much for really, I feel such a big, they were a big part of helping me to do the work that I'm doing now. So, so anyway, let's talk about both of you. So the two of you are both so incredibly powerful together and um, apart, but it's just a really unique relationship. So can you tell us about how you began this partnership and this and this friendship? Raymond, do you wanna go first? Oh, well, I um, one thing I guess that even though I put it at the very beginning of my book, Life After Life, I guess people never kind of picked up on was that the um, context and background that I brought to my interest in study of near-death experiences was that of logic and philosophy of language and Greek philosophy. And um, the reason I got interested in the afterlife question is that it is a question that many people have said is unintelligible, like the notion of an afterlife doesn't if you think about it what are you talking about seems like a self-contradiction right so um i had been interested literally since childhood in unintelligibility i was uh the, i'm interested in astronomy and the and the things that just don't make sense like when you ask the question how big is it you, you know either answer you can give is nonsensical. So, um, and and at the same time, I was reading Dr. Seuss and Lewis Carroll. So I have always thought nonsense was a great thing, and uh, that was probably part of the reason I majored in philosophy because the concept of nonsense is a very important concept in in uh, modern philosophy. So that's what I've studied, and. Um, it's a long reason to tell why, but the, you know, this applies directly to questions about life after death and near death experiences. So that was my point of entree. So I was, uh, and in that process, and everybody in medicine knows that sick patients talk nonsense, right? People who are delirious talk a certain kind of nonsense. People who are psychotic another time, uh, even though uninjured, stressed, will talk nonsense. 
and um, or intoxicated with mercury or various things. And um, so like, I guess probably everybody in medicine, I had no, you know, that probably most of the people listening to this, I had just noticed that um, in the last few days or hours or weeks of life, that people will lapse into talking nonsense. And uh, I, I recognize that uh, when people talk nonsense involuntarily, like from delirium or because they're in a terminal state, that the types of nonsense they talk are the same types of nonsense that Dr. Seuss and Shel Silverstein, Lewis Carroll uh, created deliberately. So my discovery was nonsense is nonsense, whether it's deliberate or involuntary. And I've studied this literally all my life. It's, uh, I'm not trying to sell a book, but I, I am very proud of my book on this making sense of nonsense, yes. which I, I taught courses in uh, several universities on to, to literary scholars and psychology students and so on about the nonsense. And so I was talking about this uh, some years back at a conference and then um, Lisa came forward and we just struck up a friendship immediately. She was talking about how, as she will mention to you that her, she heard that strange language that her father was talking. It was just a few weeks before she came to the seminar where I had mentioned. So that's how we got started on this research. Interesting. And to let my listeners know, um, I, Raymond and I did do an interview on his book, Making a Sense of Nonsense. So I, I really encourage you to go back and listen to it and, and read the book because it's, it's just fascinating. So Lisa, would you like to chime in on yeah, I just want to say two things that's synchronistic is that my father died 10 years ago, February. Um, you know, he died in 2012. So it must have been just months later that I met Raymond. So Raymond, we've known each other a decade, which is wow. really remarkable. <laughs> Since both of us are so incredibly young, it's so incredible. <laughs> <Wow. laughs> that long. No, but um, yeah, I, I think the thing that, uh, I mean, when I heard Raymond Moody speak, and of course, it's just been, it was an honor to be in a, in a room with him with only 12 other students, and a greater honor to, to know and work with him in the last 10 years. But what really drew my attention is when he talked about nonsense as part of human experience and language, because I was raised, um, you know, I mean, I was trained as a linguist. And the good part about linguistics is it's not prescriptive. It's descriptive of how language behaves. And, but I never really heard anybody talk about nonsense being such an integral part of being a social animal who produces language, right? And so I, I just, when Raymond mentioned that, I was really intrigued that maybe the kinds of things that we hear in the threshold that so many people for so many years and still do actually just dismiss his nonsense or just being the med speaking. And even, even if it is the med speaking, what's so interesting is that certain types of nonsense appear. Why do the same types appear? And now that my mother is also dying um, 10 years later, I noticed just what Raymond had mentioned, and I see it firsthand now, is that the, the language of delirium is different than, the nonsense of delirium is different than the nonsense of language at the threshold. They're two very different, right. they have different patterns and behaviors. So once again, the, maia, the maestro, <laughs> my mentor and friend was, was absolutely spot on about, about that, I believe. Interesting. So Lisa, can you give us a few examples of um, what people say, you know, at the threshold? Well, some of the classic stuff that was has also been documented in the wonderful book *Final Gifts* by Maggie Callahan and Patricia Kelly, um, you know, are these metaphors of travel. People say, yes. you know, um, "Get me my passport," or "The car is coming," or "The you know, I just missed the train," and so forth. And also, people oftentimes will use metaphors related to kind of their life passions. So, someone might talk about there's a foursome waiting. You know, a golfer might talk about 
there's a, a trio of golfers and they need a fourth and they, you know, the foursome, you know, they're waiting for him or her to join, um, join the team or join the, the, the foursome of, um, threesome of golfers to make a foursome. Yes, <laughs> um, yes. You hear people use uh, metaphors uh, in terms of travel, in terms of going to the other side and, and, or for example, Jeffrey Holder, who was a choreographer and dancer, the very last things he said as he was dying had to do with dance. One, two, three, four, right. one, two, three, down. So, and then you may hear just someone say, the scrambled eggs are on the rooftop. And you know, you think, what the? <laughs> you, yeah. can't, you know, you don't just hear metaphors, but you'll hear something that's, so you hear all kinds of language, um, but those are just some of them, but it becomes more metaphoric and more and more nonsensical, almost like you are reading Dr. Seuss or Shel Silver, Silverstein. Right. My mom kept talking about getting on the bus. Mm -hmm. And she'd say, no, I'm not quite ready. And then the, the day before that evening she passed, she said, I think I'm ready to get on that bus. So Lisa, do you think, or either one of you, do you think that not only are they speaking, these are the words, but they're actually visioning, visioning the other side? Have, has that ever been... I mean, I don't know how you could prove that, but what do you what do you think? Because we hear about deceased loved ones coming to greet them and to bring them over and glimpses of Steve Jobs saying, wow. And I'm wondering if like that gentleman with the golf, if he if he's seeing possibly a golf course or I, I don't know what what do you what do you think about that? I'll, I'll ask that briefly, and then I'd love to hear Raymond's response yeah. too. But there was one person whose father was a contractor and mostly specialized in kitchens and bathrooms. <laughs> and he <laughs> said to her at one point, oh my God, there's, you know, miles and miles of, of bathrooms and kitchens that need to yeah. be remodeled. There's so much to be remodeled. <laughs> and she said that it really was as if he could see just so right. that that seemed very real to him. So that's my thought. I would I'm curious what Raymond has to say too. Well, I've wondered about that a lot because um I I there's a very strong connection between uh um transcendental experiences and uh ineffability for example yes. people will say no matter how eloquent they are that they just can't describe it and um, sometimes nonsense is the best expression we have to uh, to denote some kind of extraordinary thing I mean um, you think about all the um, how very often a new discovery has to be expressed as an oxymoron. Um, I'm, it's like I'm, there's this great book on um, mirages mm -hmm. that is called The Waterless Sea. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking of mirages I've seen, and that's correct. So. The way I put it together is that people on the verge of death are trying to formulate in words things, you know, realms of experience that are just impossible for us to comprehend and to put into words is okay. kind of the, and I base that more on when I was in medical school to my great good fortune, my, my, medical school professors always would assign the terminally ill patients to me because I had the, you know, everybody knew about my work with near-death experiences. So in that, that day, you know, people didn't want to talk about death and stuff. That was in the mid seventies. And so, you know, from the beginning of my medical career, I was with a lot of terminally ill patients and watching some pretty extraordinary things unfold. 
And, um, you know, my impression definitely was that this nonsense that was coming out of the patients was they were trying to um, put into words the experiences that they were having. And and I heard, a thing I heard repeatedly, actually, I just from an old friend of mine, actually, who was a professor of religious studies out in Utah, her her husband had been a philosophy professor, and I'd gotten to know them once in 1970s. And then years later, when I went out there to lecture, she was telling me, about, as I mentioned this in my lecture, and she came up afterward and she said that her husband had died. And she said uh, that in the last few weeks of his life, he was talking nonsense. And she said, I knew it was nonsense, and she said, yet somehow in the back of my mind, it kind of registered. And I've, I've heard that kind of same, you know, the same thing repeatedly. So um, right. well, I think people are struggling to, you know, make sense out of. But, you, you know, know think about sense. what my dad said to me that is technically nonsense. He said, oh, Lisa, there's so much so in sorrow. And technically, that's nonsense, right? There's so much so in sorrow. And yet, of course, I knew immediately what he was saying is that this is a very sad moment. This is so sorrowful a moment. But technically, it was nonsense. So, you know, as Raymond said, there's a way, you know, it's like poetry touches us. And poetry yes. is not always literal and linear language. And I believe that we are not just literal animals and critters, <laughs> you know, that we respond to language that is not literal and um, an experience and expression that is not literal. So absolutely. Yeah. So to segue a little bit, um, so you have this beautiful new website. I, I just love it. Lifeafterlife.com. And Raymond, I, I always have to ask you, and I apologize because I, well, I don't apologize, but you're, you're asked this so many times. One of the quotes on the front page is, when I began my research into near-death experiences in 1968, I was a skeptic and an atheist. Now I am neither. What convinced me after 50 years of investigating near-death experiences? So I know you wrote a whole book on that, but, yeah. uh, but I'd love for you to talk about that. And I don't know it partly was um, your, your shared death experience and learning about shared death experiences. Yeah, and it's also, I mean, that word skeptic, I am skeptic still. Yes, uh, yes. Marla, by the real meaning of it, you know, I was the ancient Greek philosophy is one of my main subjects of interest and um, the skeptics were beginning with Pyrrho who was kind of my hero after Aristotle um, said well let's look at things vigorously but then withhold a conclusion so I um, you know that was the frame of skepticism from which I came into it and still have that attitude to the point where I I can honestly say on logical grounds it is not quite possible in 2022 to draw a logical inference that there's life after death although it's it's right now in in the place where it could happen I think uh, and what happened to me was I just gave up yeah, I just, I don't know what else to say. I never swallowed that thing about oxygen deprivation to the brain because one of my own medical school professors, like it's a very wonderful woman who was a psychiatry professor. My first year in medical school told me about uh, an event in which she was trying unsuccessfully to resuscitate her mother. And in that, time her she herself had what we call now a near-death experience she felt herself lift out of her body she saw the scene from above she saw her mother there now in spirit form was her words and she um saw her uh, people who some of whom she recognized obviously 
friends and relatives of, of her mothers who had died, some of whom she recognized, emerging from this light to meet with her mother and saw her mother receding into this and came back to her own body then. I mean, you know, and I, I just hear this kind of thing all the time. I, you know, the oxygen deprivation to the brain thing, that is something people resort to when they are just so fearful of saying, I don't know. Whereas to me, I say, I don't know. And, and like with God, I just, I was not, God never entered my mind. I suppose you could say I was, a, I, I, I just didn't think about God. And the reason that has changed is it's not religion. I'm not religious. And, uh, you know, living in the deep South, I'm afraid of snakes and <laughs> And so, um, you know, I'm not a church type or religious type, but I would say that, you know, I had direct experience of, you know, personal relationship with God that sort of gradually emerged through this thousands of people I've talked with who had near-death experiences. And kind of like in 1991, I think it was a, uh, uh, yeah, just the presence of God. I was in the presence of God. It was, uh, and, and so, but I am not, you know, I think that religion is, as far as I can tell, it's, it's a way that some people have of retreating from God or mm -hmm. not getting too close to God. It's like to put a religion between them and God. It's, whereas to me, it's just a personal relationship. I like to say I talk to God every day, and God has never said a word to me about religion. Yes. I figure that he would bring something to my attention, but there hasn't been any of that. <laughs> but there's been a lot of other very interesting stuff. Yeah. And hence your book. God is bigger than the Bible. God is bigger than the yes, Bible. Yes, which we so, did an interview also. Yeah, we did. And yes. I just really enjoyed it. Lisa helped so much. Yeah. Putting that book together, it was kind of, it was about a 10 year project, actually. Lisa, did you, what have kind of been your aha moments when you've realized that? Mm -hmm or if you realize, I'm assuming you have, that this is, that there is most likely an afterlife. And it's like, wow, this is, this is really, really true. Well, that's a good, actually, that's a good question. Because um, to be honest with you, I don't know if I could say that there's an afterlife, but I could say that consciousness seems to definitely is non-local. Mm -hmm. And that con I, for me, yeah, I still don't know that I could say that there's a place called the afterlife. <laughs> or, you know, that, but what I could say is that it does seem that consciousness survives in some way. So in unexpected ways. So the aha moments for me, well, of course, were all the conversations I had with Raymond and learning about near-death experiences in more depth and, ex and the shared death experience. Yes. How, you know, how is that possible that someone who's not dying can have such a very real experience of the death process or the dying process or, you know, share in um, their loved ones dying. So that was very compelling to me also. And I, I think hearing, um, it's really, I'm really glad you asked me a really good question. The, the things that really, the research that completely blew my socks off was Ken Ring's work with the blind who had near-death experiences. So people who were born blind and then had near-death experiences and were out of their body could, could see themselves. It's not exactly the kind of seeing we had, we have, but it, he calls it transcendental awareness. So that was very compelling to me that people never born with sight or very limited sight during their NDEs were able to perceive that at a different level and way than they could when they were in their body. So then it's like, well, wow, what's, what is that transcendental awareness? Mm -hmm. Terminal lucidity, um, there were many cases of that, not many, uh, but uh, maybe 7% of the people in the sample from the Final Words Project had these very 
um, striking terminal lucidity story. So for example, the most dramatic was someone I actually worked with and his mother had Alzheimer's. Um, you know, they had not had a, a really lucid conversation in years. And then she went into a coma. So, I mean, this is someone whose language was completely, you know, basically there was no sense of intelligibility. I mean, there, he had no kind of communication with her. But then right before she died, she came up, she looked at him and said, John, all my financial files are in my office in the bottom drawer on the left side. She came back to say this piece of very lucid right. information that turned to be completely spot on. And you have to wonder who was that that came back? How was it that came back? So I think, again, I'm not too sure about an afterlife. I wish I could just say, yeah, I know I'm going to the place it's heaven and there's going to be angels. And, you know, I wish I could say that. Uh, but I do know that somehow something continues. And that that's that's more what I'm convinced of at this point. Right. Yeah. Beautiful. So, Remy, can you just talk briefly about your experience when with Jeff Olson and Jeffrey Olson and Dr. Jeff O'Driscoll and the explaining what a shared death experience is. And I know you personally had one with your with your mother. With my mother, I did. I was kind of in the midst of putting together a program with a lot of psychologists and so on to study this. And incredibly, just in that little period of time, my my mother suddenly developed an illness and died and we were there with her and yeah i did i did have that and that i have uh, over the years i just heard many people with this um and it's um i think it's a really fascinating thing we need to probe into this more because um you know, people have a natural kind of inbuilt way of thinking about near-death experiences. And it enables them to have a little distance mm -hmm. because in the mind, the near-death experience is something that happens to someone else, right? Unless you've had one or something. Whereas shared death experiences, as I have noticed over the years, are a little more troubling to people because I think what it is is that they can imagine that they might be in that situation. So it's it's something people want to resist. Plus, they have no easily available argumentative context to put it into, right? The context for the near-death experience is pre-existing, is it? The afterlife, or is it something internal, like from the um, oxygen deprivation to the brain, or whatever? Whereas this is more troubling to people, and it's there's no easily apparent way of uh, of talking about it, because apparently, from the point of view of the bystanders, that the death of someone else it's kind of like they get a little glimpse into the other side, the, the whatever they are, the veils or whatever, just drop for that moment. Yes. And people can kind of realize, you know, that there's this other thing going on uh, around us that we um, are. And so, I mean, I, I mean, it is, it is, um, it's very troubling, I noticed, to the, that there's a sort of, the, the study of the paranormal is really, I'm sorry to say, it's a hobby more than anything else. It's, you know, the people, the practitioners, it's mostly their hobby. And uh, the parapsychological wing is one wing, and then the other wing is the so-called skeptical wing. Uh, and both sides have the same assumptions right, which is that they are dealing with a literal mode of discourse and that mm -hmm. um, a lot of the so-called skeptics, when you talk to them, they were, they were former believers, right, or, and then when you go to the believers meeting, sometimes you find the 
the former disbelievers. Oh, I used to be a Christian. But it's, it's really the same mentality, except that pseudo-skeptics, as I call them, it's more of an adolescent mentality. Um, it's so. very much so. And I'm not, that's not a criticism, because I myself have hardly emerged from the infantile state myself, <laughs> so I'm not criticizing. <laughs> So, I Randy, could you could you give it just an example of a shared death experience, whether it's your own or one that you've heard? So, in case people don't know exactly what you're talking about, yeah, yeah, that very often at the bedside of the death of someone else, the bystanders themselves will have all of these features that we associate with near death experiences. People will very commonly say that they at the moment of the death of their loved one, they see something indescribable leave the body, which they often describe as a kind of golden or grayish um, structure almost that I've heard a doctor tell me he saw it go through the ceiling. I mean, people, or people say that um, as their loved one is in the, the process of dying, that they themselves may leave their physical bodies and accompany their dying loved one part way toward this light. Um, or people may, the bystanders may say they see the apparitions of the, what are apparently the dying persons, uh, deceased loved ones and friends coming into the room as though to take them away. Uh, people say the light fills, the room fills with this light um, quite a few people talk about how the whole geometry of the room changes, that they no longer feel like they are in a three-dimensional state, but in some other kind of uh, environment that has an energy to it rather than a geometry. I mean, people say they, they began to realize that they're seeing things in the room from an impossible angle. Right. Things, things like that. And most remarkably to me, just I got a lot of cases where the bystanders have empathically co-lived to the dying life review of the person who passes away. At first, I, it just happened. The first number of cases I heard of this over the years were they, they had a particularly close relationship to the person. So I assume that surely you have to be very close to, it. but no, I, I've subsequently, I, I mean, a doctor, for example, a few years ago told us about uh, being called to the ER to resuscitate a patient he had never even laid eyes on. As this man was dying, he said this, the images like the whole life of this man appeared around him or a woman who uh, had been this this one of these long-term marriages i don't think they even had any kids as i recall just of decades and decades which went back to a literally a childhood friendship and was telling me about uh, you know as her husband was dying that she was seeing his life in review just like he was and you know, the song they were talking about the same things they were seeing. So, you know, I mean, it's a very hard thing to put together, but it's part of, as I gather, the collective cultural heritage of humankind that on the verge of death, it's as though um, there's a what. Um, sort of opening into elsewhere yeah the interesting thing is too from the research i've read and i i hope to have jeffrey long on the on the program to talk about his all of his research in this but it it's more real than real and it changes people's lives even the sheer death experience it's not just this dream that then they they forget That's about right. but it's it's so you asked me a moment ago about what sort of shifted my ideas about this and um, I have two things I wanted to share discuss a shared death experience I had while my father was dying 10 years ago that really was part of um, shifting my ideas about consciousness 
and also I have to I have to put in a plug, um, William <laughs> William Peters, who has done extensive research. That's why I met William Peters. Who did yeah. I say? Um, I, I think I said Jeffrey. Jeffrey Long. Jeffrey Long okay, also. I meant okay, okay. Yeah. Jeffrey Long's great too, but that's yeah. who I was referring to. Thank you. So William Peters and Raymond will be doing a free webinar together. Yes. And I believe it's going to be March 12th. And um, so if people want to come to lifeafterlife.com and either opt in or just send us an, a little hello in the contact section, we will send them all the information about the free webinar if they Great. want to know about shared death. And William did very extensive research using um, Raymond's categories um, about shared death experiences. So it's a really fascinating area. And I was fortunate enough to actually have one of them while my father was dying. And at the time, I didn't know it was what it was called until I met Dr. Moody, of course. But I was um, I was living in Napa, and my father was in Berkeley, and he was very close to dying. And in the middle of the night, one night, maybe a couple of weeks before he passed on, I felt like there were a lot of people in the room with me. Uh, you know that feeling? You can just feel the presence. And... Um, and I, I just couldn't sleep. And my husband just kept saying, go back to sleep. And I said, no, there's something, this is weird. I just feel all these people, like the room is just filled with people. And so the next day I went to go visit my dad as I did every day. And I asked my mom, um, how's dad? And she said, you know, the, oh, and oh, I forgot this part. I looked at the clock and so it was 3.15 in the morning. So I said, so how's dad? And she said, what was the weirdest thing? He woke up about 3.15 in the morning. And he said, will you tell all these damn people to get out of here? It's so crowded. There are so many people in this room with me. But David Kessler in his book talks about how it's very common that people have this experience of a crowded room, just as Raymond was talking about the visit, you know, the deceased let relatives and who else, you know, whatever beings are filling the room. But I felt them at the time that my father was complaining. <laughs> right. The room. So that was a type of shared death experience, right? And then that was another, once I talked to Raymond and learned about it and made the connection about, you know, wow, this, this is is consciousness this is non-local consciousness yes. it exists <laughs> we yeah. are more than just this body yes. so anyway i had to say those those two things thank you thank you so much yeah. for sharing yes it's william peters and i hope to have you raymond again on the show with william <laughs> one day soon to talk about that too so let's let's move forward a little bit and talk about i know that you've been involved in this in this area, it probably seems like forever, Raymond, and Lisa, you have for at least the last decade or so. How has it changed your life, or how do you walk in this life differently, just knowing what you know, or from everything that you've learned about studying the continuity of consciousness and the afterlife, and all of those important things. Who wants to start? Raven, what about you? <laughs> well, I, a very big date in my life was my first semester at the University of Virginia. The first couple of days I started reading Plato's Republic and later that same semester we read Plato's Theta, which is his dialogue about the afterlife, which in reality sets the whole picture of in Western rational inquiry into the afterlife. The Christians, they predicated their theology of the afterlife, for example, on, uh, on Plato's Theta. And I remember I was 18 years old and I remembered the moment I read this, it's like Plato in that dialogue said, philosophy is a rehearsal for dying. Mm -hmm. And that had such immediately, I said, yes. And now I have, that has been with me ever since I was 18 years old. And I, uh, now, at age 77, I marvel that an 18-year-old would have had that reaction to it. Yes. But it, that was my reaction. 
maybe because I was raised by older people who, elderly people actually, who often talked about dying and so on. But I, um, that was a big impact on me. And it happened so early, I don't know what, how to separate it. Right. It, like uh it's just i've says kind of i have never really grown up but in so far as i have grown up it's been with near-death experiences so um it's hard and it was only in the last five or six years that i i gave up like i said yeah this is i never thought that the oxygen that that was ridiculous mm -hmm. but the, i didn't know what it was and i still don't um you know, there's a lot I don't know, but I'm I'm confident, yeah, now that this, to my remaining utter astonishment, uh, it's still very counterintuitive to me. I mean, I have all sorts of questions. It's like, what about spiders or seahorses or whales or zebras? Do they have an afterlife? You know, and and you look at the world's views of the afterlife there's different kinds of like i know that in uh, the certain place in melanesia where um, the token you have to have to get into the afterlife is to have the certain tattoo you see and you know you could count like a million different yes views. yes the who's, afterlife, who's afterlife are we looking at are we talking about well what about in terms of of changing um or not changing the things you've brought into your life uh, i love when you talk about the power of prayer and i know you pray a lot so i do yeah uh well i am i tend to take this world very seriously because mm -hmm. i respond to it with panic and stuff and at the same time another layer of me doesn't take this very seriously I mean, I just to me this is a I've kind of figured out a long time ago that this thing we're in is a kind of theater and we live out these stories and then I gather we go through some incomprehensible process and then we're back on, a, on another story line and um so I can pretty much maintain that perspective now constantly of this being a play. But at the same time, things hurt and you get you they, that immerses you right into it again. And um, so I'm just still like I was at seven or eight years old too i just love learning new things yes, yes. and uh, and we all know it, george ritchie has told us all about the hall of hall of knowledge that's right i remember george saying one time to me that he saw into this place of learning that he glimpsed into he said it, you could compare it to a library like one section of it and he said one section of this part of it that would you could compare to a library he said contained the holy books of the universe and uh, so you know i'm very con content to say i don't know much at all but i do <laughs> enjoy i do enjoy learning what i can yes yes so you yeah. have to know a lot to know that you don't know you know what yes. i mean <laughs> yes absolutely and these these are these are big questions big <laughs> the biggest so lisa you i've watched you move from athens to asheville north carolina right yes. south carolina yeah north carolina yes. and i know you love to dance and your energy is just so beautiful and i can feel that that kindness and compassion coming from you. And I feel as if maybe, maybe things, how do I want to say this? Doing this work has, not that you were not kind before, but doing this work, how has it, 
how has it changed you in the way you live, how you walk in your life? That's um, oh, in so many ways, I don't even know where to begin. It, it definitely ha- gives me this sense, you know, the way I, when I hear people talk about consciousness in, in my very limited mind, it, the, the image I keep getting is like a web, you know, that there's, mm. this, and, and, and as I've done this work, the web has expanded yeah. so that I feel less alone. And there's a sense that there's all of this around me. And at this point, I may not be able to see it, but my, but what my sense is that when we, it's like crossing to another dimension, so, or something, but there's this web. So I do feel much more supported in life. And I was just thinking as Raymond and I were talking right now and speaking and I'm, you know, um, I was so terrified. I, Raymond probably when I mean, can probably remember, but I was so terrified to speak out about what I thought or stand up and communicate. I mean, there's a sense of um, comfort I've gained in myself by doing this work and feeling more and more trusting. And I do believe much more deeply in source or something that holds me in a way, you know, because I've gone, I've had a really rocky, you know, kind of a tough three years. A lot of unexpected things happen, um, as we all do in, in the course of a lifetime. And yet I feel like I'm much more resilient because there's this real sense that there's always this web. And, you know, hearing the stories from NDE years, um, especially, um, it's really hard. And, you know, you hear about this being of light and it's very, I mean, I'm convinced some kind of, and I can feel the light. And I actually had a very direct experience of it myself when I was younger, um, which I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to talk about today, but I'm going to start talking about more in, in the future. But um, so all these things, and I I think also just Raymond, working with Raymond, my mind, it's, it's been a spiritual process. It's also been a mental process. I mean, I've grown so much as a thinker about, about yeah, just, um, well, to begin with language, because that was what I was trained in as a linguist. So my whole, my ideas of language have been so profoundly expanded to, to first to think of nonsense as not being taboo, but also I do, I interviewed a lot of psychics for um, my book and this research. And it's been fascinating to me that there's this whole kind of language that psychics work with that is very symbolic. And yes. many psychics describe having their own lexicography. So, you know, for one psychic, they may the person may see an apple and it symbolizes your a mother and someone else may see an apple and it represents evil, you know, or something. So it's really uh, fascinating. So I think the other thing that's happened to me is my idea of language has just expanded radically of what is language. And I, I'll never forget another very compelling moment for me was when I read Evan Alexander's, um, I think it was Proof of Heaven, um, but he talked about non-linguistic communication, right? And like that seemed at first like a paradoxical statement, not with yes. the communication. <laughs> so I think, you know, um, partly you know, working with Raymond and getting to know him, these categories of how, you know, paradoxical language, like, uh, you know, non-linguistic communication. <laughs> right, right. And there's this whole realm of paradoxical language that, belongs to another round, you know, another world or another Mm -hmm. sphere and, you know, uh, specifically the afterlife, but other things as well. So, um, so on a spiritual level, I feel much more at home in my body and in, I feel safer. I do believe in um, some kind of God in a way, in a deeper way than I ever have. And um, I've learned so much. I, I just, you know, and I was one of these people thought you could only learn in academic settings. Right. And you can learn a lot there, but if you find a wonderful mentor <laughs> and friend, a lot of doors open. <laughs> Absolutely. I've been very grateful about all the things that um, that I've learned through Raymond and through the people I've met from Raymond. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. That's beautiful. Yeah. So guys, we need to start wrapping it up, but I just wanted to um, ask what, what words of wisdom would you like to, to give to the audience or I, have I asked you everything that you wanted to, wanted to talk about today? Lisa? 
Yeah. Um, a few words of wisdom. One is that if there's something that really makes you curious, you know, my father was dying and I noticed some very bizarre things with his language. And a lot of us say, um, well, doesn't mean anything that I'm curious. Like you know, we discount it. But I really encourage people to cultivate and embrace your curiosity. My whole life changed because I became curious about final words and it took me on a path that is without a doubt one of the most amazing paths of my life. Mm -hmm. So I say to all of you, if you have a question, don't run away from it, embrace it, write about it, talk about it, listen to podcasts about it. But I would say today is really trust and embrace your curiosity. Yeah, that's my word, my words of wisdom for today. And Raymond, what about you? Well, you know, I'm kind of thinking about this is a tough time for people, this yeah. pandemic. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of glad there's so much information now with all these near-death experiences. I, I hear that the latest number of Americans who died from COVID is now approaching a million people that's about what one out of every 330 of us oh my god and so uh, wow. you know this is a good a good time i guess for a lot of people to reflect on the transience of life yes. and what death means yes so so true well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's truly been an honor. And if people want to find you, um, how would they how would they do that? Come to lifeafterlife.com. And yeah. there's also a free excerpt of Raymond's God is Bigger Than the Bible on the website. Um, and feel free to you know write anything you like in the contact section if you have questions. And yeah, that's the best way. Yeah, and you you also have an a second annual NDE summit coming up. Is that is that oh, correct? Yeah. No, 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 mm -mm. no. No. Okay. No. Thank you for asking about that. that okay. Was, a couple okay. Of years ago, it was fabulously hosted by Trisha Barker. But great. Um, okay. Oh, okay. I was. Yeah. I, I saw yeah. that one. Yeah. It was yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah. thank you so much. And yes, Robin, did you want to say something? That's from the the one next is for the people who saw all of them their past life <laughs> exactly <laughs> conference of uh, people who in their past life had that previous conference. yes yes <laughs> got it got it well thank you so much and i'm sure i'll be talking to both of you soon and have have a great rest of the day yeah you too. thank you so much thank you, thank you.